Thank you. Uh, I have no disclosures related to this talk. Um, Herb uh, Stein was an economist and chair of Nixon's Council of Economic Advisors. I hope uh, our council appreciates that I'm quoting a Republican. Um, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. And how does this apply to ECHO? Well, the national exp health expenditure's share of GOP is projected to uh, rise to 35 percent by 2040, unsustainable, and cardiac imaging is a huge amount of this cost. And so we are in the crosshairs of CMS uh, and every other uh, person who's worried about this uh, expenditure. I uh, didn't take this talk particularly seriously because predicting the future is uh, not my forte, but there will be three key drivers of change over the next six years. Uh, be prepared to be a little depressed. The first is POCUS. So handheld technology continues to advance. Everyone is doing it. Um, the horse is out of the barn. Um, handheld images are great. These are handheld images that I myself achieved. Now, I'm a good scanner, but these are beautiful images. It fits in my pocket. Um, there's 2D and color only. Uh, there are no measurements, and there's variable storage capabilities, but that's uh, not, that's because that's what the consumers want. It could easily do Doppler. It could easily do measurements. Um, several studies have compared uh, studies done with standard machines to handheld, and the correlations are very good. But in terms of triage, as we heard from Dr. Jury, having the medicine residents do a handheld ultrasound resulted in uh, people being divided into systolic heart failure and uh, diastolic heart failure 22.7, 22 hours earlier than if they waited for a standard echo. Uh, if you triage and eliminate some studies that are clearly normal, uh, you could eliminate a number of inpatient studies. And a recent uh, publication by our own uh, Dr. Zogby, uh, past president, showed that um, the sensitivity and specificity of handheld echo for evaluating cardiac structures and function was really quite good. Here are two uh, studies we did at um, an undocumented immigrant uh, health uh, center in uh, Philadelphia. This woman was referred for a murmur. You can see that she has mild uh, pulmonic stenosis. And this was a person who was referred for hypertension in which we picked up a small PDA. Uh, we had to, I'm now the CEO, so I wouldn't do this anymore, but uh, we snuck these patients into our echo lab at 6 p.m. and scanned them uh, for free, uh, proving that they did indeed have mild pulmonic stenosis and an insignificant uh, PDA. In fact, the European guidelines for the management of pericardial disease recommend a handheld echo for pericardial recurrence during hospitalizations. And really, which would you rather? Uh, on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock, the patient's heart rate went up 10 beats. Would you rather stay late and have the tech run up and do a full study? Or would you rather the fellow went up, plopped a POCUS on and said, yeah, there's, the effusion is uh, not there. Please remember that uh, we live in a very lucky uh, country and only 5 to 7 percent of the world's population lives within uh, reach of emergency ultrasound. So here's our own Jim Kirkpatrick, um, Carol Main, Jose Banks doing uh, portable echoes uh, in uh, Vietnam. But what I'm going to tell you is that although we think of ourselves as uh, cardiac ultrasound experts, uh, everybody is doing POCUS. This is, uh, I'm so old that this senior EP physician at uh, Penn was my fellow in the 90s, and he admits himself that he was particularly echolucent. Um, and uh, who should be using it, and how will they be trained? I promise you the ASE and the cardiology community will not be the ones to decide. And so everybody's going to be doing POCUS. Here's a sampling of recent citations, lung ultrasound detected, uh, during inpatient echocardiography are common and associated with short-term and long-term mortality. 
uh, point of care ultrasound by pulmonary uh, critical care physicians showed that they had excellent correlation. Guidelines for the appropriate use of bedside general and cardiac ultrasound in um, critical ill patients. Point of care ultrasound in acute internal medicine. How can it be delivered? Focused ultrasound in regional anesthesia for the pain specialist. Can point of care ultrasound by the anesthesiologist reduce the um, predict spinal um, predict hypotension during spinal anesthesia? Emergency physicians can detect RV failure. Unless you think we're the only group that's being disrupted, look at this last one. Evaluation of point of care thoracic ultrasound and BNP for the diagnosis of congestive heart failure in cats. So please remember, we are not the victims. The horse is way out of the barn on this one. And we need to take the lead, ASC and cardiology, in collaboration, education, cooperation, quality, and outcomes. The second um, thing that's going to change our lives, as we've already heard, is value-based imaging. We heard a very nice talk about it. Uh, and I have to say that uh, business talks do seem boring, um, but they are going to be very important. My take on uh, fee-for-service is that paying for process locks us into rigid behaviors. So deviation compromises revenue and is discouraged. And approved efficiency is also discouraged. So not doing that repeat echo, it's just too hard to argue. It gets boring. What's the matter? Just do it. But that isn't quality-based uh, care. The fee-for-service is going away. Uh, this is from Gordon Morwood, our chair of anesthesiology. Um, Fee-for-service uh, today is 52%. Uh, in six years or five years, it's going to be less than 35%. And that's going to continue to change. So we need to figure out how to, de how to deliver lower-cost care. And um, we paying for the, the final product rather than fee-for-service is what's going to happen. In this case, a measurable improvement in health and quality of care. Although health care is not a restaurant, consumers may not return after a single bad uh, encounter. And cost is an increasing issue for patients. This year, up to 54% of patients had a $1,000 or greater out-of-pocket uh, potential expense. And we also know that 70% of the American population could not cover an emergency cost of $500. Increased efficiency in health care, we're not the victims. We are going to lead the charge for great patient care. So we have to be the leaders. You need to remember that improved personal efficiency isn't going to improve efficiency. I can read 50 echoes. I could read 55 echoes in a day. It doesn't really matter. But elimination of low-value or no-value health care is going to improve efficiency. So how does ECHO prove uh, and improve its value? We need more outcome-based studies demonstrating improvements in outcome related to ECHO. This is going to be big data, big data sets. Obviously, we can't do randomized clinical trials of if you have a grade 3 murmur, should you get an ECHO or not. But we need more integration of the findings, of ECHO findings, into the EMR and more standardization of indications and elimination of necessary studies. Let me show you this ECHO on a patient who's short of breath, obviously has uh, some major RV pathology and a very high RA pressure. And the old report would say the RV is massively dilated with severely decreased function. The IVC is severely dilated with no respiratory variation. Okay, we heard in one of our talks that uh, in the last session that many people don't read the ECHO report, and if they read it, they don't understand it. Here's the new report. The patient, and what do you got to do? You got to look at the EMR. The patient has a history of pulmonary hypertension with elevated PVR. There's new RV systolic failure and severe compression of the LV, limiting cardiac output. The RA pressure is severely elevated. New renal dysfunction likely due to venous hypertension. That tells people a lot more than the old report. And I have to admit, we still do old reports. But we don't have to. We have the EMR right on the same computer that we're reading. 
The number three change is going to be artificial intelligence. I went to a session this morning, and it's unbelievable the number of things that um, artificial intelligence can do and is doing. Look at this study on diagnostic errors. Uh, a very brave study um, from Boston uh, Children's, they looked at 22,000 studies. Uh, 22,000 studies a year, they looked at 147,000 studies. They find, found 254 diagnostic error, er, errors, of which 77% were avoidable or possibly avoidable. Notice that the percentage of diagnostic errors is incredibly tiny. But um, many were preventable, and many had moderate or major impact on patient health. And the only thing that predicted an error was if the echo was done between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. or if it was on the weekend. So when we look at AI, we looked at, we just saw the mass general um, variability. What we want is something that's accurate, not biased, not noisy, but accurate. And so some CAD already exists, you know, warns you your LA measurements um, are normal, but you put down the LA is dilated. Um, but deep conv convolutional neural network and deep uh, machine learning is really going to change the way AI can be applied to our uh, echo reading. The, um, we already have facial recognition, object recognition. Echo recognition is really not rocket science. And uh, you know that GPUs have uh, revolutionized this area. They were invented to make uh, graphics for video games, uh, but have been applied to a number of other areas. Uh, this is a paper from uh, almost 10 years ago, the influence of computer-aided detection on performance of screaming mammograms. And the computer-assisted diagnosis did a little worse. But nowadays, um, the uh, computer-assisted diagnosis recognizes where something appears to be abnormal. Um, neural networks can tell you there's a 99% chance the study is normal. Uh, low re this is a paper just published on low-resolution CT lung scanners, screening AI versus radiologists, and you'll see that the screening AI did much better than the radiologists. I asked a mammographer who's uh, my age, who's read more mammographies than I've read echoes, and that's a lot, um, if, she, if she always used computer-assisted diagnosis, and she said it would be malpractice not to. So here's another example of uh, we're already using AI to read uh, retinal scans and say if there is diabetic uh, retinopathy or not. Uh, it costs about $15 to do a study. We get reimbursed $10, so having AI read them is actually uh, really an incentive. Echo Analysis software already exists. Um, they're exponentially better than, remember, the old auto EF. It'll get cheaper, faster, and we will become dependent on them. Um, the uh, paper by Gandhi, just published uh, in Echocardiography, looks at all the automation and machine learning and says, hopefully, however, in this lifetime, it's unlikely that machines will be able to completely replace human experts in echocardiography interpretation. I would say that that's a cheerful statement. So to summarize the developments by 2025, Many other practitioners would be doing ultrasound, but we can be the leaders in outcome research and collaboration. Fee-for-service is going away, but we can be the leaders in the drive for quality and taking good care of patients. And artificial intelligence will come, become increasingly relevant, and if it improves patient outcomes, we must embrace it. We used to say in our echo lab, at least no one will ever be able to teach a monkey to read echoes. And now I'm not so sure. <laughs> Just watch this guy. Oh. 
Watch this. His handler has a snake. Nope, don't want to see that. Oh, my buddy. (laughs) So in the future, AI may really help us with lots of things, including having monkeys read echoes. I want to thank uh, Jeff Hendrer, uh, the chair of ophthalmology, who gave me the uh, retinal scan, and Gordon Morewood, who uh, gave me some of the slides on uh, value-based care. Thanks for your attention.